Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Christopher Isham. I'm the uh, Bureau Chief for CBS News here in Washington. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about Syria. Uh, we're very lucky to have a very strong panel here. Uh, from beginning on <clears throat> my immediate right is Robin Wright, a uh, distinguished scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and a senior fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She, during her career, she's reported on all over the Middle East. She is a, she's a real hand. Uh, and she's seen everything, and she's written numerous books about, about the region. Uh, to her right is Juan Zarate, who's a senior advisor at the senior for, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's a former deputy national security advisor and is the author of the new book, Treasury's War, the Unleashing of the New Era of Financial Warfare. I would also say, uh, just as a plug, he's also a consultant to CBS News. <laughs> uh, to his right is Phil Mudd, uh, who served as a deputy director of the CIA's Counterterrorist Center, as well as the FBI's intelligence advisor. He's now a director of global risk at Southern Sun Asset Management and is the author of the book, Takedown, Inside the Hunt for Al-Qaeda. So uh, let's begin with some of the images we've just seen. Uh, we, uh, one month ago, we were on the cusp of, a, of launching uh, military strikes against Syria in the wake of the August 21 chemical warfare attacks. We heard very strong language from the President, Secretary Kerry. Um, of course, that has devolved into a political process. Uh, we're now in the process of disarming Syria of its chemical weapons. So what does that mean? Is that progress? Juan? Well, it certainly it's progress on the chemical weapons. There's no question about that. But I think that the problem is that a month ago we were talking about the exit of Assad, and now we're talking about the entry of inspectors. And so the entire narrative has shifted, and the narrative about American involvement uh, has shifted as well. But I think we can't ignore the two years that have transpired in terms of the conflict. Uh, over 100,000 killed, uh, millions displaced both internally and externally. And the reality that we now have three policy goals, which confuses matters for Washington. It's the fall or the transition from Assad, hoping that the Syrian state doesn't implode and become a failed state. Uh, and also hoping that this doesn't become the situs of the resurrection of a new al-Qaeda uh, with foreign jihadists flowing from around the world. And so it's a confused landscape where American involvement seems uh, timid, uh, less sure, uh, but certainly in terms of the chemical weapons, uh, can't deny that there is some progress there. I think many Americans look at Syria, they see Hezbollah, they see Alawites, they see Sunnis, uh, Iranians, Al-Qaeda, uh, you name it. Uh, and I think uh, probably a lot of people say nothing good can come of this. Um, and nothing good can come of our in or in more involvement by Americans in, in this mess. Um, does America have real interest, uh, do you think, Robin, in Syria? Syria is the strategic center of the Middle East in the same way that Egypt is the political trendsetter. And Syria has, because it is bordering Turkey, a NATO ally, Israel, one of the strategic pillars of US policy, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, it, is, it has a spillover effect. And the problem now is that two and a half years in, we have a war in Syria that is in fact many wars. It is a war that has deepened the sectarian divide in the Middle East greater than at any time since the modern borders were established a century ago. It is a war that has become a proxy war for the two kind of different camps that are involved. You have the United States, Turkey, the European Union, the West in general on one side against the regime, and then you have Russia, China, and Iran backing the regime. Uh, and there, are, you know, the great question for, for the United States in terms of what does it do? Does it take the moral road in light of the deaths? Or does it take the realistic role in, in light of the complications and, frankly, you know, the problems we had in the aftermath of Iraq? And the question becomes, if we get involved, does this become a proxy war that pits us against others? And in many ways, I think Syria already is more complicated and um, more dangerous for U.S. interests than Afghanistan was. And I share the um, view of, of the man on 60 Minutes who said, 
Uh, he's worried about Syria breaking up. It's very hard to see how Syria holds together. There are now three identifiable regions with different flags, different security forces. We've reached a point where, as you noted, the, the, good, the good guys um, probably are only 10, at most 20 percent of those of the, of the fighters in Syria. The rest are in, aligned with various different factions, um, and there are over 1,000 different militias now operating in Syria. This has become a, a complicated war that is only likely to get more complicated before we reach some denouement. And that's why the sequel to the chemical weapons process, which is Geneva II, ideally held in November, um, bringing together the diverse factions involved in the war is so critical. I am not an optimist that it's going to lead to a resolution in part because we've now invested in Assad's future when it comes to complying with chemical weapons, but also because the Syrian opposition, frankly, is feckless. It has proven unable to uh, come up with a common plan. It's been unable to even come up with a viable alternative government. Um, I want to come back to Geneva II and the political process in a minute, but um, Phil, you studied counterterrorism and, and you studied jihadi groups uh, for a better part of your career. Uh, we've watched as this conflict has devolved from uh, beginning in the, with its roots in the south of Syria as a civil uprising, and it's become more and more uh, of a sectarian uh, conflict with a, with a heavy dose of jihadis and Islamists uh, gaining, in, in, but possibly by some accounts, the upper hand in terms of the strength and numbers and, and in terms of the strength of their financing and, and, and weapon supplies. Um, is this something we should be worried about? Yes, but I don't think we should make this into a Goliath. Look, we face now strategic threats when I was sitting at the threat table, starting over the course of time with Jamal Islamiya in Indonesia. Then we had problems in places like Saudi Arabia in 03, 04, beyond. Then you go to Iraq, then you go to Yemen, then you go to East Africa, then you go to Nigeria. You know, as someone who did this for 25 years, at some point you have to say, not every one of these is a, is a strategic threat. There are a couple things I'd be watching at a strategic level. The first is the emergence of leaders who have the authority and experience to start to, to, to say, our target isn't only local, it's Western Europe and North America. I don't see that galvanized leadership yet. And the second is the emergence of safe haven, like the safe haven you might have seen in Indonesian schools when Jamal Salimi rose, like you saw in Afghanistan in the 90s, as you saw in some, some parts of Yemen. Those leaders, in my experience, need space where they're not fighting a local adversary like Assad to start to say, our vision is bigger. Let me close with one comment. I don't think the questions we face are about jihad, and I don't think they're about chemical weapons. In the wake of 12 years of war, I think we have faced a question that, that results from the fact that we are morally crippled by war. And the question is, Forget about national security. I don't think we have significant national security interests here. 110,000 plus people are dead. What will we tell our children? And I believe the answer is going to be, because of the legacy of war, we said we tried to define this as a national security issue. We didn't want to talk about the moral implications, and we walked away. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a strong argument, I think. Uh, and of course, we've been there before in both Bosnia and in Rwanda. Uh, and in both cases, uh, well, and certainly in the case of Rwanda, there were many regrets, and many of the people involved in that are currently uh, serving in, in this administration. Um, but one doesn't hear very often, Juan, uh, about that argument. That argument is, uh, is not one that you hear too often these days. Is it something that we should be revis revisiting? Do you agree with Phil? I, I think absolutely. I think. The, the problem and the issues with Syria are that we have multiple interests there. So in, in a sense, I disagree with Phil to a certain extent. Our interests are humanitarian, are moral. They are geopolitical. They are in terms of regional stability. They are in terms of the growth of a new jihadist class and, and movement. Um, and so our interests are very clearly implicated, whether they're moral, geopolitical, or security. The question is whether or not we have policy, imagination, and will to actually determine whether or not we can affect the environment, even if we are war weary. Because I, I, just, I, I agree with Phil in regard to our war weariness and, and the binary choice that we seem to have with respect to our involvement. If we have an interest, 
it doesn't necessarily mean we have to put boots on the ground. And we don't have to have a straw man policy argument that it's either all or nothing. And I think part of the problem we've had is there's been confusion as to what America's interests are and what our will is, uh, putting aside military power. And our allies in the region have seen that confusion and felt it. And we've been unable to then lead a coalition with creative solutions, whether it's on the humanitarian side with uh, no drive zones or refugee uh, safe centers or, or regions. Uh, how do we work well, what, with the Turks? On what the should be the goal? I think that really comes down to it then. Should the goal be confronting the humanitarian conflict and stopping the killing uh, or trying to at least minimize the killing? What, what should be U.S. goals in Syria? I'm happy to answer that. Go ahead. I, I, think, I think first you deal with the humanitarian crisis, in part because that fuels the regional instability. Jordan's fourth largest city now is a refugee camp. Uh, Turkey is, is buckling now on the border regions under the weight of the refugees. You've seen the conflicts in Lebanon that are starting to rise because of those pressures. And so you have to deal with the, the moral and the, the humanitarian dimensions of the refugee problem, in part because they are also the geopolitical problems. I think you have to find a way of having Assad leave power. And at this point, I think it has to be a diplomatic solution because after two years of, of confusion, the thousand plus groups, the sp splintering of the opposition, there's no clear path forward other than through diplomacy and certainly no will to use military force to change the battlefield. I also think, and this is where I do disagree with Phil, I do think we run the risk in Syria in the heart of where Al-Qaeda and the Sunni violent extremist movement has always wanted to operate, of seeing a resurrection of a new Al-Qaeda movement because they are building space, they are governing, they are controlling the battle space. And what's interesting here is they've learned the lessons of the Taliban as well as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so they're not only taking the fight to Assad and galvanizing foreign fighters from around the world, they're not only raising funds via Twitter and other mechanisms that are novelties, but they are also baking bread and mending wounds. They're learning to play the game of hearts and minds, setting up for a very new generation of jihadists in the heart of the Levant. Uh, this was always the dreams and the imaginings of Ayman al-Zawahiri, and it's coming to pass. And so I think we have multiple interests and goals there, and we have to be able to play three-dimensional chess. It's not a binary choice. It's not about one policy goal. It's about using whatever tools we have and whatever suasion we have to actually impact the environment. Uh, Phil, so if your objective is primarily humanitarian, what, what, what do you think the goal should be there? Well, first of all, we're behind the eight ball here. We tried to define this as a national security problem for too long because we're afraid to say we want to intervene someplace else after the history of 12 years. Right now, I think, I think Juan's right. We have some opportunities with people like the Turks and the Jordanians to step up more. And I think we should have locked and loaded a month, month or two ago. The question was not simply whether the, the fox in the hen house is guarding chemical weapons. The question, I think, was broader, and that is we have a tyrant. We are not a global policeman. We didn't intervene in Darfur. We haven't intervened elsewhere. But periodically, we should look in the mirror and ask a question. As Juan says, and I think this is dead on, is a moral imperative a national security imperative as we seek to project American values into the 21st century and maybe regain some of the ground in the last decade? And I think the answer is yes. So how do you do that specifically? Well, as I said, I think we should have loaded missiles and locked onto Assad. I think we should have been in the humanitarian game a couple of years ago. I think the political leadership should have defined this not simply in narrow national security terms. I think we should have worked more with the Turks on things, as Juan says, like no drive zones. We should have learned the lesson that people are still talking about in terms of Rwanda and Burundi. That clearly was not a national security issue, but I think people are still saying maybe we should have told our children that we did more. So you would, you would advocate going in. Um... Damn, all right, we're done, thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, you would have, because of course the kinds of strikes that were on the table um, a month ago were described by Secretary Kerry as unbelievably small. I don't think that really falls in the category that you're discussing. Go big or don't go. So let's go big. Uh, what does that mean? I would have said go after regime targets, don't only go after CW targets, go after the most critical elements of the regime in terms of presidential protection, in terms of the units, including air and ground units that are going after the, Iraq, the, the Syrian population. There are no winners in this campaign. I don't think the opposition, as fragmented as it is now, is going to provide a path to democracy in Syria. 
I, I think you're going to see, as we've seen in places like Egypt and Iraq, when you have ethnic and religious divides in places that are used to tyranny, the path to democracy is bloody. That said, that's not an excuse for not saying when tyrants kill 110,000 people, there damn well ought to be repercussions. Lock and load, not just against narrow targets, CW related, but against regime targets. Uh, Robin? <laughs> Well, let's say I take a different course. Um, you know, I, w I wish I thought after Iraq that we were better at nation building than we are. And I think um, this is a part of the world we don't understand very well. Um, we, our intentions are always good. We think because we are the most moral nation, uh, that we have the mightiest military, that we are capable of doing more than we are. And I guess my concern with intervention in Syria is that the minute we cross the threshold of intervention, we then gain responsibility for what happens afterwards. And when you look at what's happening in Iraq today, which is getting back to the levels of violence of 2006 and 2007, when you look at what, hap what the state of Libya today where we had a, a UN, NATO, Arab League endorsed military operation. Uh, and Libya is a very weak state where the prime minister was kidnapped yesterday um, and where there are over 300 militias that are um, challenging the authority of the state and where again you may see the state crumble into two or three pieces. I am very worried about um, racing to war and particularly going big. Um, you know, Colin Powell's old line, which Pottery Barn denies, but he quoted Pottery Barn as, you break it, you fix it. And uh, I think Syria could be far more complicated than anything we've ever undertaken, uh, far more costly, and the danger is far greater. I too am troubled by the morality of all these people dying. Uh, but one of the great problems is that the Syrians themselves bear some culpability for what's happened because the opposition hasn't been willing to come together, whether it's the fighters inside the country, and we're talking not just about two or three factions, but a thousand, uh, whether it's the politicians who live in exile. They just haven't been willing to form an alternative. I do, however, think that there is beginning to take shape an idea for an alternative that no one will particularly love, but it does provide something which the international uh, community could possibly agree on. Syria is due to hold presidential elections in, I think it's September next year. And there is a growing sentiment that this is a moment that you get Assad to step aside and then have the Syrians vote an alternative, but much of the re regime, the guts of the regime, would stay in place, which is a means of uh, ensuring minorities, whether it's Christians or Alawites or Druze, uh, nervous about the Sunni majority. Um, and it offers a way to circumvent the opposition that hasn't proved viable so far. Again, it's not a solution anybody likes, but it gets rid of the Assad family, which is ruled now for 43 years. And it's something on which the Russians and the Americans could agree. Just one final I don't, I, I don't know how you do that, um, because the Assad family is so, is the regime. I mean, it's so enmeshed in the regime. If you look at an organizational chart, it's the family and the, they're all intermarried into all of the different uh, agencies and security and the economy, organizations absolutely. and the economy and but this is where if the Russians and the Iranians and the Chinese going along for the ride say it's time for you to step aside then it becomes viable as I said nobody's crazy about it and it's not the best case outcome but if you're looking for something that gives Syrians a chance to vote on their own future gets rid of Assad and begins a process of political change. That's, that's one alternative that you increasingly hear people now um, in the halls of power in various capitals talking about. Chris, the challenge, of course, and, and Robin's right in many respects, but the challenge, of course, is that Assad has to understand in his calculus that there's a, actually a possibility that he could lose 
that, that the, the hold on power and the Alawite hold on power is actually at risk. That's not the case anymore. And in fact, that's one of the game changers in terms of the chemical weapons deal. I mean, it, it, it in some ways in Scotland. him time. It's given them time at a minimum, if not a greater sense of security, and certainly guarantee that the U.S. is not going to uh, lock and load or, or get involved in, in any uh, material way. Um, I think we've been paralyzed by the question that Robin raised, which is, what comes after Assad? That has constricted our policy imagination, because then, by saying that, you're, you're in inherently restricting your ability to think about what else can be done to actually move Assad forward and creatively think about what comes next. Um, on the financial side, you know, the question is, are you willing to try to tip the balance? Um, could we launch, for example, uh, a preemptive asset recovery effort, an asset hunt for the regime and the Rami Makhloufs of the world, the money men who, who surround and support the regime? Explain who he is. Rami Makhloof is a longtime businessman tied uh, to Assad, a cousin, a family, to Chris's point about the enmeshed family. Um, with businesses all around the region. Uh, the Treasury Department designated him in 2008 uh, as part of the corrupt elements of the Assad regime. Even has the Dunkin' Donuts franchise. That's exactly right. And so the question is, can you do things that actually start to tip the balance and the calculus for the regime itself and those around it? Um, can you do things and are you willing to take the diplomatic heat, for example, example to go after, let's say, a Russian bank? that may have facilitated some of the arms deals, that may have facilitated some of the chemical precursor shipments, uh, those perhaps should be designated as primary money laundering concerns. And I so think, the I question is, can, can we think creatively about pressuring uh, without being constricted by this question of what comes next and is it all or nothing? But it's, I'm not convinced that, the, that this administration, in any case, has concluded that uh, Assad needs to go. I mean, it, it, you've got an interview that Mike Morrell, an outgoing deputy director of CIA, did recently in which he said that the strategy should be to put pressure on Assad to get him to the table, but not too much pressure to overthrow him. Um, Phil, I'd be interested in your, uh, your thoughts about that strategy. Look, look I, I, don't, I don't get it. Okay, this is not a choice between walking away and going to war. We're talking about no boots on the ground, sending a signal to a, to a tyrant who passed a line that was identified by the President of the United States as red line and has murdered more people than anybody I can remember except maybe Pol Pot. So that's point one. It's not about going to war. The second thing is we didn't break it and we don't have a responsibility to fix it. Again, this is a legacy of 12 years where we define the future in terms of the past. Let me give you a horror scenario. We, we launched a month ago, disaster hit Syria, there's a civil war, would you say then, A, we have a responsibility to fix it? I would say no, they broke it, they fix it, we can help. Would you say B, that sending a message to a tyrant who believes in mass murder was inappropriate? I would have said no, I still think we did the right thing. We, it's not Pottery Barn, we didn't break it, and we're not responsible for fixing it. So what, what do we do, what, 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 what do we do the day after? Let's, let's say we go big. The, well, first of all, my question is, one of the questions would be about spillover. What happens to Jordan? What happens to Turkey? You've got to get them to the table and say, what are we going to do about refugees? What are we going to do about feeding them, sheltering them? I'm not sure we'd have a responsibility for policing civil war, especially since we're not going to put people on the ground. So I think you can have damage limitation, but I don't think you can look in the future when you have grand questions about what responsibility we have as a people and say, I don't know what the future holds, and therefore, I can't do anything. Robin? Well, I just say, once it sounds great that we can, whether it's no fly zones or no troop, no boots on the ground, um, once we cross the threshold of action, we bear responsibility for seeing it through. We can't just remember we spent five years having no fly zones in Iraq, and we still went in with boots on the ground. Uh, ended up being there almost a decade, and Iraq is has greater unemployment, greater insecurity. Uh, and so forth than it did even under Saddam Hussein. Now, I'm not saying we should have kept Saddam Hussein in power. I'm just saying let's be realistic about the cost. And, and once we engage in no-fly zones, um, we're kind of there. And if nothing happens, then people will say, well, Assad's still around. The United States is a paper tiger. It can't accomplish things. It's been weakened. You think the American public is going to go along with that? I think this is where... Um, I'd love to think that there was a, a down and dirty solution to this 
real conundrum. I also think that when it comes to the question of the day after, we have to, fact, we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question. Do we want Syria to hold together as a country? Something that I'm not prepared to answer yet. I'm not sure it can hold together. And I also think that there is a danger that if it doesn't, that it has a rippling effect across the region in setting a precedent in these artificially created countries that we could see the redrawing of the map of the Middle East. I think there are a lot of the really much bigger questions that when we look at engagement, what does it mean? What do we want to come out of this? And I think these are a lot of questions that we haven't asked ourselves, much less answered. One. I would just say we also haven't asked ourselves the question, what are the costs of inaction? Because everything that Robin's describing is a consequence of not doing much of anything to actually change the environment. And so the Mike Morrell quote that you talked about, Chris, um, is stunning to me, in part because I don't know from a policy perspective, you know, having been in the White House, how you actually thread that needle. How do you, how do you try to intervene, uh, but in a, in a very small or mild way, where you're, you're trying to kind of keep a stalemate of a civil war ongoing so that you don't have an implosion of a state, but you try to effectuate the, the diplomatic solution. I don't know how you thread that policy needle or even how you get that done on the ground. You, know, you train only uh, 500 soldiers instead of 1,000. Uh, you teach them uh, semi-good marksmanship and instead of really good marksmanship. I don't know what that means. And so I think, I think we haven't asked ourselves very tough questions. Robin's right about the day after. But I also think we haven't asked ourselves the question of what inaction means, both so, to the region, to stability, to the growth of a new Al Qaeda, and frankly, to the perception of American power. Because the one thing I would say well, is, I think to some degree we've seen what inaction means. Of, uh, no, no, that's right. And, it, and it's brought the very things we've been worried about from day one in Syria. Regional instability, the rise of the jihadis, uh, humanitarian disaster unlike anything we've seen uh, in recent memory. Um, this is a disaster. And it's been inaction that has actually contributed to that. And so I think we have to look in the mirror, as Phil said, and also ask the question, what is the absence of American, American power mean in the region, and what are the long-term implications? One point on that. Our inability to shape the environment and, the, and the, at least the diplomatic uh, framework for this um, has led countries like Turkey to make short-term calculus, calculuses that are, frankly, not in our interest allowing foreign fighters to flow in in the hundreds into Syria and to see the rise of more and more extremism in Turkey is a real problem. But Turkey's allowing it because they want a solution, they want it quickly, and the U.S. isn't there to come up with one. So I think the question is, uh, we've seen what, what, what the, the path of inaction has taken us and where that's taken us. If we do, if there, if there is intervention, um, let's say, and we're not talking, no, I don't think anybody at this point is talking about boots on the ground, but if, if there is intervention in some form, uh, the question then is, how do you do it in such a way that you can affect the outcome in a positive direction so that it's, you're not, uh, you're not sending it further over the cliff and you're not embroiling the United States in a complete quagmire? I think that is one of the questions that a lot of people have. Just one shot. I, I don't think there's, I don't think there's an outcome here that works. So we as America, as Americans, like to go into situations and say, for example, in Egypt, there will be a path from revolution to democracy that'll take about three and a half minutes. That dog don't hunt. So if you look at the possible outcomes here, regardless of whether we intervene or not, it's it's a despot in power. It's the rise of the Free Syrian Army and people who potentially will engage in civil war against both the jihadis and maybe the Alawites, or it's the rise of jihadis, and we know the answer is there. So if, if you look at this and say, you know, beyond dealing with humanitarian problems on the border, beyond dealing with the Turks and the Jordanians, beyond trying to ensure this doesn't slip over into another civil war in Lebanon, I think I would go in from a negative perspective and say, I don't think we can believe that we can engineer an outcome that will come out to be as clean as Americans want. Regardless of whether we get in or not, this is going to be a disaster. Is there a way to get to, to I mean, one of, the, one of the, as we saw from the previous panel, uh, they're trying to sort out who the good guys are in Syria is difficult at best. Um, That's diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> Are there good guys? Uh, us. <laughs> <laughs>
are there good guys? You know, look, the, te the, the teenagers who sprayed anti-government graffiti on the walls of a remote town called Dara in southern Syria were noble creatures. And the, the, this really was a pro-democracy movement um, that got out of hand. The question, of course, becomes, could we have done something earlier that would have steered it? My fear is that uh, U.S. military intervention would only have ensured that even larger numbers rallied to the cause of, of the Al-Qaeda um, uh, offshoots, franchises that are now operating in Syria. So I, you know, no one will ever know. Um, that's a, a hypothesis. Uh, I think one of the real problems is that even among the good guys, the ones who are secular, not affiliated with Al Qaeda and so forth, we've seen a number of problems uh, emerge. There's terrible corruption uh, of some of the aid that's going in from whether it's medicine or food that groups are taking for resale to pocket um, or to use for their own purposes or to give to their own people. Um, that, you know, when we talk about good guys, it's really hard. Uh, to identify someone we would like to step in and take over, except among some exiles we think we know, but who haven't lived in Syria for a very long time in most cases, and who remind me a lot of Ahmed Chalabi, who was the Iraqi leader who kind of duped the United States into believing that he was Spartacus and he would, you know, lead to a, a Iraqis to rise up against Saddam Hussein, um, and it never happened. And so I worry about looking toward those exiles as the alternative, that we really have to find the solution at the local level among the what they're called local coordinating committees that are trying to provide for their people, that are sending messages out, that are co trying to coordinate little bits of aid among themselves. That's really, I think, where the future lies uh, in Syria, not with the ones we look at conventionally as the opposition. Can I just one, add one thing? You know, everybody talks about what role should the United States play and why don't we do more? And I keep saying, wait a minute, uh, what about the Russians? They're the ones who are providing all of those arms that have killed 100,000 people. Um, they're the people who are blocking tougher sanctions at the United Nations that would really put the squeeze on Syria in many ways far more effectively than on Iran because Syria's economy is in really dire straits because of it's running out of oil, that there are, there are a lot of ways Russia could play a much more effective role. And if I fault the administration, it's for not doing more to squeeze the Russians into um, squeezing Assad to at least be realistic, to at least cooperate. I think we're running out of time, but Juan, just final thoughts, engagement versus non-engagement in Syria? Well, I, I think the, the one opportunity and the one bright spot with the chemical deal, other than getting the chemical stocks out of uh, Assad's hands, is the fact that it does open up a diplomatic window. And I think uh, what we need to do is seize that window to find a, a broader solution and actually move the narrative back to where it was and, and to move it away from how are we going to ensure the inspectors can get to sites and how do we destroy these things and move it to the broader question, as Robin indicated, of what is the transition here look like? And I think that then becomes a, a fundamental moment in question because if diplomacy can't bring that uh, moment, then we're either going to have to live with a stalemate in an ongoing civil war with all of the negative externalities that we've already witnessed or we're going to have to come up with a new policy and start to exert our will and perhaps even use military force. Uh, but I think that there's a window here now to pressure the Russians and to see if there is a diplomatic uh, way forward. And in part, uh, we've committed to that already. Phil, you see the Russians being helpful? Absolutely not. I mean, look, we, we, told, we told Bully 1, who said, I didn't use chemical weapons, we trust you. And we told Bully 2, protect the schoolyard. And then the, and then the teacher said, and make sure doesn't, nothing bad happens out here. Look, the Russians have decided, after years of working with us, that their future does not lie with us. They are not a trusted partner. They're not a trusted partner in any sense in my old business. And they're not a trusted partner in the world of diplomacy. I think, for those of you who don't know Mr. Zarate, I would say this rarely, listen to what he says. I think he's dead on. We can talk about idealistic solutions. We've set a path. Let's try to make it work. Let's think about what happens if it doesn't. And please, let's take a step forward beyond narrower questions of jihadis, narrower questions of democracy, and say, can we return to a time when we looked in the mirror and said, there is a higher place for this country. That's it. 
Well, I think on that note, I would thank the panel. That was, I think we cracked that case. <laughs>